turn on mainstream media and it's being talked about and really just you don't bat an eye it just goes in one ear out the other you don't have an aha moment that this is taking place today by governments in our lifetime you know what i'm saying this isn't a science fiction thing like you're talking about with johnny depp this is literally taking place by darpa by the chinese government by other governments around the world to accomplish their agenda and it all ties into what she talks about nephilim agenda to the federal reserve this enslavement this control this purpose manipulation to take us to a human 2.0 something different genetically Welcome to the Days of Noah podcast, where we talk all things biblical, supernatural, and strange. This week we're going to be reviewing Blurry Creatures podcast episode number 41, which was the first episode with Dr. Laura Sanger, where she discussed giant genes, Nephilim DNA. In this, we're going to be discussing some theories of the Nephilim resurgence after Noah's flood, how do targeted prayers of intercession work to cleanse a land that is defiled by sin and iniquity? And further going into how the Nephilim agenda continues to this day in the form of hybrid breeding programs, transhumanism, and ultimately how it leads to the mark of the beast. Well, good morning again, everybody, and um, welcome back. And so we're going to dig into episode 41 of Blurry Creatures with Dr. Laura Sanger. And she's talking about um, giant genes, kind of the DNA traits and stuff like that. Um, Just right off, what were some of your guys' impressions or things that stuck out before we get into it? I think well, the doc- one... Oh, go ahead, go ahead Doc. <laughs> I think the, the one thing that I uh, I got out of it that I enjoyed was um, when she talked about the uh, uh, the agenda of the Nephilim and uh, how me- messing around with the uh, DNA and the ge- genomes of human beings, they were trying to stop the Messiah from being born. Mm-hmm. And um, I thought that that was, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's a pretty devious plan, but it's... Uh, it's pretty, you know, um, well, obviously it was stopped right, uh, and didn't work out for them, but I, I thought that was really cool. Yeah, and, um, you know, it's interesting. I think we mentioned this once or twice before, but God kind of showed some of his hand in Genesis 3 with the curse on the serpent. You know, the seed war began there, and he showed some of his hand that it was going to come in this form through the through the line of humanity um but that's how good god is at you know 4d chess he doesn't (laughs) he can give away some plans and still win and another real quick point and then luke you go ahead um was listening to the the audiobook of uh ryan peterson which we're going to have on as a guest uh before too long in his book judgment of the nephilim He does a really good job of following the biblical uh, story of how many times Satan tried to mess with that human genome of the Messiah. So we think of the big one with, you know, the uh, the flood and 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 the you know sin of the watchers and all of that stuff. But there were many more attempts, and it's interesting some of the some of the marriages and some of the things that happened much later in Old Testament history were, were further attempts. So, Yeah, so Dr. Laura is one of my favorite um, researchers uh, that I've seen interviewed, and she's, you could tell she's got a doctor's back, type of background. Um, 
that even when the there there might be questions by Nate or Luke, um, and they might go down a little rabbit hole or something, you know, she's she's right there to bring it back and and the, I know we're, she had a part two and she just very very thorough. Um, she did an excellent job explaining things and definitely encourage everybody to dig into her uh, her book and um you know just hear hear the details that she shared so um and it and it definitely ties into what uh Tim Pence was talking about with the Nephilim Jekyll Island she she said she was influenced by that so that's that's kind of where my initial thoughts are as that was her motivation that interview with with Tim Pence was her motivation and then God leading her to to do do a little more digging and that's that's what came about with that book you know it's it is fascinating to to see how um yeah that Rob Skiba's interview with Tim Benson it Tim Benz um really shaped well it it started her on her journey as the way she put it to write her book and she felt like a like God placing this assign, assignment on her, you know, to get this book done. And, um, yeah, I'm on like chapter six or seven of it. It's a thick book and she wrote it as kind of a, she, she calls it in real time, just kind of as she's exploring things and learning things, you know, not necessarily knowing what the next chapter is going to be. Um, it, again, if, if people don't know who are listening, uh, her book is, uh, um, the roots of the federal reserve. She definitely gets into, I know we're going to get into some of the nitty gritty of it, but, um, kind of an overview, Tim Bentz, his visit to Jekyll Island, what he sees, the Canaanite altars, and then her own research of the Canaanite lineage and how that goes, it's traced back to, um, Genesis 6, the Fallen Watchers, Nimrod, and then fast forward how it reconnects, you know, Jekyll Island going forward to present day stuff, um, the Federal Reserve and other issues that we're dealing with in, in the world. And, um, but yeah, one of the things I think that stands out to me in her discussion of this was, and I know this is just a theory of hers, was she called it epigenetics. And it was like um, DNA markers, maybe not just DNA. It was also behavior traits mm -hmm. that she found common in those that were connected to the Nephilim agenda. Yeah, yeah. The epigenetics that that's a um, a more recent um, field of science. I don't know, last couple decades or something. That basically says that um, there are, uh, similar to like a light switch, genetics can be turned on and off. And so you have, I think the, I think the, the prefix epi, she said, is like uh, over or something like that. So it's like over top of your genetics. And so, yeah, one of the possible theories for um, how did... The Nephilim uh, resurgence happened after the flood and possibly through Ham's wife if she had a had the epigenetics of carrying the Nephilim DNA and then maybe a sin, iniquity, something like that can turn that on. So, you know, or another way to think of it just apart from like this topic or spiritual issues is, you know, you might have a predisposition for a certain type of cancer in your family. Um, but based on maybe your lifestyle or things you eat, stuff like that, you can potentially keep that genetic trait uh, dormant. Um, so so it's not like it's not like fatalist, like it's going to happen for sure, but it's a predisposition and that's that's a word I think she used when it when it came to um, Ham's sin with with Noah and or wife, however, there's different theories on what his sin was, but that he predisposed his uh, progeny to iniquity. 
and he was the 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 grandfather of Nimrod, I believe. Is that is that correct? Yes, it, it, he he. Um, it was through his generational line that Nimrod came to be. Um, and I know this is just a theory, but I just feel like would God really allow a tainted DNA to be on the ark when he's going through all of this judgment to cleanse the earth? That is all a good this, question, yeah. Uh, Nephilim hybrid, you know, the world was corrupt. Noah was the last, the, those that, humans that remained, his family, immediate family, that was the last pure humans genetically. That's the research that I've seen. So why would a tainted DNA be allowed to be on the ark? I'm more of the opinion that it's not so much a tainted DNA that gets turned on and off. I'm wondering more if it's like, it's by your, because we're already in this fallen condition, you know, since the time of Adam. So I almost feel like any one of us could essentially, um, in, in your way you described it, turning it on by your lifestyle choices. So yes, as, as we've done some research, there's certain families and they tend to be in the elite um, royal class in society that are very particular on their genetics and where their family tree goes to as far as like Nimrod. But I think I think it's more about the iniquity force, the sin that takes place way back then. And then that power of that sin, because it hasn't been cleansed by the blood of Jesus, you know, they haven't asked for forgiveness. It's just gotten worse and worse and worse. And it's almost like a demonic power that just, it, it builds. Yeah. It's like a snowball going down a hill. It's just, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So in my mind, it's not so much a genetic thing. It's more a willful disobedience to the things that she talks about in her book. You do these certain things like human sacrifice and pedophilia and, you know, drinking of blood and all these really awful things. And then some are pretty common, like they were talking about <laughs> kind of jokingly, you know, red hair, that type of stuff. Right. Those fingers. traits. Sure. But I, I feel like it's more a will, a, a, a will issue mm -hmm. than a genetic issue. That's yeah, just... and that, and that makes sense. Except for the thing that keeps sticking out to me with that is how do you how do you get you know ten, fifteen, twenty foot giants out of that? And so I feel like there has to be that. Um, genetic trait passed down that's different than humans. But I totally agree with you that it's not merely that they're, they're maybe Nephilim DNA. I, like, just going back to the flood, it wasn't merely, oh, you're an abomination because you're not human or you messed with the human genome. But it was that plus, um, you know, their thoughts being violent all the time. Well, you speaking of the, the Nephilim giants and those that are of large stature or the remnants of them, those like King Og, um, the Amakites, you, we discussed it before in other sessions, you know, in Genesis, the ones that Joshua, the ones that King David faced, there was giants after the flood. It, I mean, there's evidence in the scriptures to, and I believe their genetics really were tainted, but I don't think I'm speaking of those. I'm speaking of the, the human line that was on the ark. I don't think that those were tainted. That's just, maybe I'm just off base, but yeah, that's just my no, opinion. No, that's fine. And there are, there are many valid um, opinions and questions to that. And like you said, it just seems kind of, strange that God would go to all the trouble of a flood and then yet preserve it. And I think, I, I think Dr. Laura said it, but there's, a, there's at least a consistency in God allowing uh, free will choices to mankind that, that allow us to take a bad path. So you think of the tree in the Garden of Eden that they weren't supposed to eat of, 
He didn't cause them to sin, but he made it available. And then if if that's a theme that God used again with the eight people on the ark, okay, I wiped it out, but as long as you guys don't go down this rebellious path, um, humanity's fine. It's not, it's not going to, <laughs> there's not going to be a Nephilim resurgence. But through Ham's sin, and then eventually Nimrod, perhaps that turned that epigenetics on. So that's, that's kind of where I land on it, but I totally agree with you that it's, it's not a done deal, you know, to say how, how that resurgence happened. Yeah, we don't, we don't see the, the 100% evidence of, of the, the cause, but we do see the effect. You know, we don't know what, you know, how there was giants after the flood. We don't know all those things, but we do know there was. So, I don't know. Yeah, and also, and we've talked about it in past episodes too, you know, if you want to take literally the seed of the serpent well we know and who knows when it began but we know from you know sra survivors uh in their testimony they said that they literally had offspring with satan and so we can we can take that literally if that's actually what happened so whether it's a the you know the seed of the serpent is kind of this nephilim seed more indirectly or directly uh, yeah we know it's it's happening and that and that leads into kind of the hybrid hybridization program that's been going on with UFO abductees and like I said SRA uh, survivors um, transhumanism that's kind of the outline i guess of of the nephilim agenda as dr laura puts it these these continued plans of of satan to thwart uh god and to defile the human genome so let's uh let's let's take it another way so don brought up one of the things that he thought was interesting her point on the reason for Genesis six, the reason for um, the corruption that took place, which ended up in the judgment of the flood, um, Noah's flood, but you know, it was to stifle or to prevent the Messiah from coming. So obviously that wasn't effective. The Messiah came 2000 years later, you know, now we're, we're we're AD. We're after Christ, you know. Um, so what is what is the reason for the continuation of this enslavement? You know that she talks about. I kind of know the answer, but I just want to open it up to discussion. Like you hinted at some of the things with the SRA survivors, the you know the pregnancies that are happening, then dis then 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 the, the embryos the infants are taken, you know, in the, in the UFO survivors situation. So there's present day genetic manipulation going on. What is the reason that it would continue? Yeah. Don, what do you think? Um, I wanted to go back real quick to, um, the, uh, uh, the statement about, uh, why would God allow, um, you know, Nephilim genes or tainted genes onto the ark? And I wanted to just uh, see maybe it was found in the uh, genealogy of Ham's wife. Um, I don't know if, uh, I can't remember if in Genesis, God calls Noah righteous and says, take your family with you, or if he calls the whole family righteous. And I I believe that it's just Noah. I think that's Um, correct, yeah. And um, when it comes to kind of why, why would God allow um, these things to continue, I, I, think, I think he allows 
I think he's allowing all these things to continue to bring everything to a huge head at the final battle uh, where he will be just completely glorified. Um, I think once, I think once uh, end times uh, events really start to roll, um, I believe that uh, the human, the, the non-believers will really start to uh, understand their actual roots. Um, I do like the uh, the idea of uh, kind of jumping the genome or whatever based on a lifestyle. I think that that has some validity to it um, because, you know, if kind, kind of uh, the way I know the way Pete looks at this with, um, you know, with salvation that, you know, or with with various things that happen in the universe that um, that God doesn't, you know, control every little speck. Mm -hmm. um, and so that gives uh people these choices uh, to kind of corrupt themselves yeah um i i would answer luke your question kind of this way um because you know a number of guests on blurry creatures for example have brought up or either or either uh, nate and luke have asked this question does satan think he can actually win and um so so to kind of that question tied into yours i think it's there he's trying to win on a technicality which is okay god said he's going to do it this way okay you know satan is very familiar with every word of the book of revelation where his doom is is forecast so how can he win other than delaying things and so i think everything he's doing is meant to subvert by a loophole a technicality or a delay um delaying the inevitable and of course one theory one theory is also that if he does have a third of the angels with him and then many many demons which are different than angels um that he's outnumbered and you know part of the hybridization is to build up an army for that for that final battle so that's kind of what I see there, but that that's yeah. kind of what um, I I'm leaning towards. Um, Pastor Doug Riggs, Pastor Russ Dizdar, um, they all talk about it in their experience with survivors um, that they feel like this is a uh, e even Russ Dizdar's book, The Black Awakening. You know, he was he was told by someone that was sold out, you know, to darkness, you know, it's like, yeah, you, you got your revivals and you're looking forward to these great moves of God and all these souls. It's like, you don't understand how many there is of us and, you know, the, the onslaught that we're going to bring, you know, it's like this counter revival. Right. So it was, it's, it's also what this talks about in the gospel, you know, Jesus said, you have, the wheat and then you have the tares well who sowed the tares hmm. the enemy did mm -hmm. so you know it's it looks like the real thing you know but it's not you know i think i said it before i've, I've if you look up the definition of or uh the characteristics of wheat when it gets to maturity it bends yeah so it's like a, yeah it's symbolic of of humility whereas a tear or, or a false wheat is going to stand up proud and not and not bow so it's very it's it, it the lord used the correct the correct imagery you know to describe the enemy yeah you know i just um, i just love how his and, creation has so many analogies to spiritual truths like that that's just amazing isn't it it is yeah. and this is another thing i was thinking of when don you were talking um there's somewhere in the scripture, Old Testament, where the Lord was waiting for the iniquity of the, of I think it was the Amorites, Am, you know, to the, basically to their iniquity to become full. It was almost like he allowed this sin to get to a certain level, and then he brings the judgment. And maybe it's it's similar to what he did in Egypt, you know. It got he got the glory out of it. I mean, centuries, thousands of years later, we're still celebrating the Passover 
and remembering what he did and giving him glory, you know? So maybe, maybe it's kind of along the same lines. I think so too. Um, one, one point that I had in our outline for day for today is, um, it does seem that the way God's sovereignty works or often works is whatever we as humans allow or disallow activates God's power or allows evil power to flourish. You know, as we're looking at things like um, Dr. Laura talking about spiritual mapping or Tim Benz talking about the gatekeeping principle, we see this idea of what we allow, you know, flourishes one way or the other. Like, nothing is neutral. And so if God chose that he was going to have the body of Christ represent him on earth, then what we allow towards the good side, towards him, allows good things to be preserved and evil to be held back. And then what, but then again, what we allow on the evil side seems to give evil a foothold. Um, and so I want to touch on um, one question I had in the outline was, how can uh, a defilement of land happen, and and how can we actually cleanse the land if we weren't the ones to defile it? And so I want to look at just a couple of Old Testament verses real quick, because this is, um, again, what, what Dr. Laura is talking about with uh, with spiritual mapping is there's actually ways that a geographic region can have an evil demonic uh, presence or power or enduring uh, effect generation after generation because of some egregious sins that were done. And so I'm, I'm kind of looking at some of these new, uh, Old Testament verses with new eyes because... I don't know, I just think, like, we don't take the Bible literally enough sometimes. We think it's figurative language. Um, in Numbers 35, 33, you shall not pollute the land in which you live, for blood pollutes the land, and no atonement can be made for the land for the blood that is shed except for the blood of one who shed it. Um, and then Ezekiel thirty six seventeen, son of man... When the house of Israel lived in their own land, they defiled it by their ways and their deeds. Uh, Numbers 35, 34, You shall not defile the land in which you live, in the midst of which I dwell, for I the Lord dwell in the midst of the people of Israel. So there's all this imagery of defiling land. You know, and of course the most famous one that we've quoted recently, Second Chronicles seven fourteen, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and heal their land. Now did God just put that in there to be, you know, poetic? Like if he's literally saying you need to literally humble yourself, literally pray, Seek my face, turn from your wicked ways, then I will literally hear from heaven, I will literally forgive your sin, and I will literally heal your land. Like, it just doesn't, it doesn't make sense if that's figurative language. And if what Dr. Laura's talking about with spiritual mapping that she learned from, I think it was George Otis Jr.'s book, uh, was, was where that term was coined, is true then it it opens up these verses in the Old Testament that there was literally something, I keep using that word, <laughs> that would that defiled the land and created, you know, because Dr. Laura's talked about, and we've talked about, portals, right? Like Jacob's ladder was like a like a angelic, you know, divine towards heaven portal. But then there are also portals uh, interdimensionally to allow you know, demonic beings to have access. Right. I, I, I think you're spot on. Um, and the first scripture you said, I mean, 
it actually named the sins. So the, sh the shedding of, of blood, murder, innocent blood being shed, um, corrupts the land. And then you look at what happened in the story of Jonah, right? He didn't want to go to Nineveh. He was sent by God to go preach. But what did Nineveh do when he actually was obedient? They declared a fast. They did all the things that it, that you just quoted in Second Chronicles 7.14. They decla declared a fast from the king on down. I think even the animals were put on a fast in, in Nineveh. Wow. You know, it's like, don't give that cat any food, yep. you know? <laughs> and um, And God had mercy and judgment was removed. Mercy came in. Grace came in. Healing to the land took place. So you follow God's laws and his precepts, and mm -hmm. you can get blessings. You don't follow it, you're heaping curses on top of yourself. Your land's going to be corrupted. Your lineage is going to be corrupted. And those sins can be passed on to the next um, generation if you don't take care of it. Yeah, now that's an excellent segue too because I wanted to talk a little bit about the difference between sin and iniquity. And I think it was um, Daniel Duvall who was on Blurry Creatures, one of the more recent episodes, and he has a website, I think it's called Bride Ministries, where um, where he, help, he helps people get set free deliverance-wise and other, other ways. But I think it was him that said on on his first episode with them that about defining iniquity differently um so just if we look at the strongs um so iniquity is strongs 05753 and it's perversity depravity iniquity guilt or punishment of iniquity and and so, and that's similar to how I heard, uh, I think, Daniel describe it, is it's something more corrupt. You know, it's not like, oh, I sinned this morning, or, you know, oh, I shouldn't have said that. It's it's more a pervasive stronghold of corruption, I guess. And I think that that is part of what... So, so when we look at that verse, um, that the iniquity of the father is carried on so let me look that up again real quick because i i did i did look this up the other day um and some About the iniquity yeah passed on to the second to third generation right because some versions don't use the word sin they use the word iniquity and some versions say sin so let me just look i that would up put here. them I mean, without looking it up, I would, I would, in my mind, interchange those words. I think yeah, I I, I and said, I, and I some said, said iniquity, and some and some translations do, but I I wonder if there is um, I wonder if there is an accuracy to the word iniqui iniquity that 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 maybe is a better way of putting it. So. Just give me a moment. I'm Maybe gonna... so, but I think who is the guest you just quoted, Don? Don Daniel Duvall. Daniel. Yeah. I think he's in the same line of thinking as, as Dr. Laura when when she's looking at the Nephilim traits. Um, it's certain sins that are, you know, some people think sin is sin. Well, can God forgive? Any sin, I believe he can, but without repentance, so sin unchecked, iniquity unchecked, left alone, passed on from generation to generation, I think there is weightier sin that both those individuals were discussing, you know, and specifically the shedding of blood, you know, that type of sin unchecked, unrepented, you know, being passed on is going to cause, I don't know, it, like legally speaking, you know, 
greater consequences to the land, to your family, to your sure. You know what I'm saying? It's yeah. not just like, well, I've had a, I, I've got all these liars. You know, we're all con artists, all the way back to great great grandfather. You know, okay, well, the sin of lying is a bad one. It's talked about in Revelation. And who's the father of lies? Satan. So yeah, I, I was trying to set that up as a as a small thing on a white lie but a lie is actually a big thing so i think there's categories you know yeah yeah is that, what, what i'm getting at I, I agree i don't i don't think all sin is equal so so looking at that famous verse exodus 34 7 um king james says keeping mercy for thousands forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin so just i'll pause right there briefly just using three different terms for kind of the same thing, because I think there are differences between iniquity, transgression, and sin. And that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. And then the ESV also uses the word iniquity. So there's other translations that use the word sin. But if we take this idea that maybe it's something different than just mere sin, that it's a corruption. Um, It makes sense when we're talking about turning on genetic traits or epigenetics or, you know, the Nephilim resurgence possibly through through ham, that these things are visited. And um, Laura uh, talks about a study that was done with, um, like, 10-year-old boys, if they smoked or overate, that their grandchildren had significantly shorter lifespans. So I think there's a principle that God is laying out here that, yeah, it affects several generations, but faithfulness, I will bless, you know, a thousand generations. So that's interesting. Dr. Laura did talk about that, and I, I thought that was a very interesting point. I, I forgot about that, and and how the actions of of myself, whether it's a fruitful thing or something I need to repent of, and how that it can affect my grandchildren or my great grandchildren, positively or negatively, and that's kind of a scary thought. You know, it's like it's like, okay, I'm having a hard hard enough time. You know, dealing with myself, being, being, <laughs> yeah, dealing with myself, and now you're tell, you're laying all this this burden on me that like, you know whoo. my actions affect the innocent. It gets heavy per se. Well, that's it does get heavy. That's that's and, where and, I'm, and it's it, it's funny because my uh, you, you probably heard the story of the chief and the and and the and the boy talking about the the two wolves. Yeah, we we mentioned you know, it. I think an episode ago. Yep. You know, it's, so what you feed is what you empower. That's right. You know, so, and that's, and that's why the scripture says you have to die daily. You, your flesh cannot be redeemed. It has to die. So it has to be crucified. And then, and then if you're, you're trying to do it in your own strength, I mean, how many times have, you know, you hear stories or you got your own experiences, own testimony, struggles that you might have. But if you try to do it in your own power, you're powerless. But if you but if you're going after the Lord and allowing him to fill us, empower us, I don't know, we can be overcomers. So there's definitely there's definitely hope. It's not all doom and gloom. You know, it's not all this pressure on me. But, uh, yeah, and I th- and that's so that's why um, looking at like Tim Benz's gatekeeping principle is so challenging and convicting, but also motivating because wow, if I can, if I'm really you know grieved over things that are happening in my area, you know sins that are happening in my city, um, I can actually make a difference without, you know, setting foot in that area and even speaking to one person, I can have a difference in how I live by what is allowed in my city. So, it, yeah, it is very heavy, but then uh, and, uh, on the flip side, it's also motivating, I think, too. Um, but, yeah, it's interesting when, 
when Laura talks about some of her, some of her stories of her spiritual mapping team saying things like, you know, we we discerned that there was say a a, a portal in an area like a, her trip to Italy or um in her spiritual mapping uh YouTube series she talks about a a high school that had a bunch of suicides and there was an issue going on in there that she can on behalf of that school or that area that building come to the lord and agree in prayer for healing of that area i thought that was really interesting because it's like it's not even the ones that defiled that area that have to do the repenting um i wonder how that works like but but on behalf she's able to do that Well, I mean, let, let's think of this, the scriptures. So when Joshua possessed the land, the land was defiled. So there was physical things that they did where they would tear down structures and destroy idols and stuff. But then there was the, the spiritual aspects of that God had already given Moses, you know, how to consecrate things how to anoint things how to pray over things and make things holy so it was almost like they did practical things in the in the natural to cleanse the land but then they did spiritual things as far as prayer and that type of stuff that probably got even more to the root of the issue to 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 cleanse that that area that they're going to occupy and dedicate it to the Lord. I mean, there's a famous scripture where the Lord tells Joshua, wherever your feet tread, I will give you. So as a representative of Christ, we don't realize the power and authority that we have to do the things that you're talking about, to step out and to and be mindful. We've been doing this at uh, Friday night prayer at our church, not just going in there with a set agenda, we're going to pray this every Friday, but really waiting on the Lord and asking the Holy Spirit to lead our prayers. What is it that you want us to pray about today? And I think if we were to do that and partner with him, um, kind of like Tim Bence has done as a lifestyle, as a Christian, and I can't wait to talk to him and, and hear more stories and 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 be mentored a little bit by that interview um because he's made a practice of that you know he's he sounds like a joshua in this generation that is tr going where the enemy was and repossessing that for the kingdom of god so um yeah no I, cool. I agree um so one thing i think that ties into what you're saying there is matthew 16 19 um, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And some translations, not many, but I've heard this talked about, that it's actually better said, so the New American Standard says it this way, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. And so it's like, God's kingdom in heaven has already declared things to be so, but then it's it's through us as gatekeepers what is loosed or bound. Um, so I think that's really interesting. But, uh, yeah, I wanted to tie it in what you just said to, um, to informed intercession, as Dr. Laura, Laura calls it, and let, because you just mentioned it, um, the inquiring of the Lord specifically, what is it that you want us to learn today? How should we pray? Where should our priorities be? You know, there's so many good works that we could do or think of or, or be creative about, but like, what is, what is on God's heart for, you know, me today, for my family this week or for my city this month, whatever. Um, so she calls it informed intercession in, in terms of doing that spiritual mapping where they, through discernment and research, kind of figure out 
these targeted prayers. Do you, do you have any opinion or thoughts on like what what do you think is like obviously God can work in in whatever way that he wants. Like if I say, "Hey, um I don't know what, you know, John's going through, but God help him." Or please bless our city. You know, it's a, something kind of blanketed like that. I I think God works through. However, it seems like there is a strength to specificity. Do you have any ideas? I think there, yeah. I think there yeah, I think there is definitely strength in in the specific. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm I'm thinking of the scripture where Jesus is kind of condemning the religious people of his day, where he talks about uh, vain repetitions. Condemn- yes, yeah, with the vain repetition. And if you think about, it's not just the repetition; it's it's the constant speaking. It's they feel like with their with their adequate words, their their quantity of words, they are accomplishing so much. And I think I think all Christians can do a better job of talking less at times. Maybe say a simple couple prayers, maybe say some praises or some worship songs, but take some time t- to meditate. You know, and and it could be reading reading the scripture just in your mind. I don't know. Yeah. I, I haven't mastered it. I'm You're just, right. I'm just saying, I'm just saying that I think there needs to be a balance where we're not just talking so much. It's kind of like, I feel like churches tend to have a set program. We've got to move on. We've got to move on. Yeah. We've got to move on. We've got to move on. And where is the pause? Where is the, even yeah, the pause could be in worship. Sure. You know, okay, Lord, I'm going to take the next five minutes and I'm going to worship you. And I want you to lead us into what's next. Hmm. So like it's that. that, that meditation, we're honoring him, we're listening, we're seeing where he's going to lead it. And that's what we try to do on Friday nights. Hmm. And different people might pick up different things or be led to pray about certain things. And then we all get an agreement on that. And then it just kind of see where the rabbit trail goes and every Friday night's different as far as the flow of the, of the service. It's not even a service of the prayer meeting. Now at the end, we might have specific needs. This one's sick, this one's sick. Let's lay hands in this one. You know, let's lift them up, call out their names, that type of thing. But in the beginning, we're trying to, with our prayer and our worship, have a time of, pause and receive what the direction i think there's power in being specific and being led i mean there has to be because look at how much jesus was our example how much did jesus the second adam fully god fully man got away from his disciples and went and prayed so he valued that time and i'm sure he wasn't talking the whole time yeah to his father <laughs> that's true he was i'm sure he was listening he said well i only do what my what i'm instructed mm-hmm. well if you're talking all the time how are you getting instruction that's right man you're, you're not you're, listening you're doing it with that friday night group you're talking about exactly what you know i'm exploring with my family in an organic church or or uh I, I called the Facebook group uh, the non-church Christian assembly because the ecclesia is an assembly. It's not a it's not a building or the Lord's house. It's a different word altogether. But you're you're doing it. You're you're functionally letting God lead you moment by moment. And there might be uncomfortable silence or what are we doing next? But like you said, if you have a pre-planned service. Because you don't have that in the Bible. You don't have a church service. Same time every week, same format every week. That's not what happens in the New Testament. Um, so we have filled up what should be a unique uh, experience of edification with one another as believers with all sorts of agenda and... And we've so I'll, I'll put it this way: the way Neil Cole puts it, um, he he says we've traditional church has raised the bar on what church is, 
and lowered the bar on what a disciple is. So we've asked much less from the average person that shows up, and we've raised the standard of excellence of what church is really high so that only a few can do it. And he says the opposite is what needs to happen. We need to lower the bar of what our church gathering is and raise the bar of what a disciple is. And so it's... Not only is it we don't know how to do that because we've filled up um, our agenda with so many things, we've never learned how to have Christ be the functional head of our meetings. So, yeah, but that's awesome, man. Yeah, you're you're I, doing it. <laughs> I, I, and, I, and I don't have a problem with a set time of, of meeting because obviously we have a set time that we get together for prayer on Friday night. We have a set time on Sunday morning that we get together. But I think, and, and you know, the, the pastor should be filled with the word and be prepared to give something that's going to strengthen and edify and, and you know, f- fulfill his mandate, you know, empowering and equipping the saints to do the work, you know, outside the church. But in the in the preparation in the the program of meeting of of worship and taking offering and give you know you got to be it it's you, it it comes back to what i was saying if you're you're so programmed out you, it's like you're doing all the talking you're not doing any listening you're not being led at all and you basically doesn't you you made no room for the Holy Spirit to come in and to maneuver the service how he wants. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean, uh, a sobering quote. I don't know who first said it, but it's been said different ways. As you know, if if the Holy Spirit left uh, most Sunday morning, you know, church services, would anyone even notice? You know, because we kind of have our own. We fill it up with our own things. Um, yeah, that's, that's very very true, and, and that yeah. and that took place with uh, King Saul. Oh, you know, for the sure. The spirit of God left him, and he didn't even know that he had lost the anointing that the, the presence had left. And I I don't think it's on um, this particular episode that we've been talking about with Doctor Laura, but it was a subsequent one that where I think she talks about Saul and how he may have actually had uh, Nephilim DNA, and that um, his his act of not listening to God when God commanded him to wipe out all the Amalekites and he wanted to spare King Agag, um, that, that Dr. Laura says he's, he handed over that battle to the enemy right there in the seed war. And um, then there was the quote from Josephus. Maybe this was in this episode, but anyway, um, where or the Jewish historian Josephus says that the reason Saul did that was he found uh, Agag to be, you know, a very handsome and very tall man. And he he just thought, oh, what a waste, you know, to... To, to wipe this guy out, so he preserved him. So you know, Agag, um, seemingly having having those giant genes, and Saul yeah. siding with the enemy there. Yeah, I do remember Josephus saying that. Yeah. Um, it was very interesting, and, it is. but it was his uh, lack of detail because he, in his rebuttal or his excuse making to the prophet well i i preserved the best because you know i was going to sacrifice those to the lord like like i was going to i'm going to fulfill the mandate i'm just doing it my way like i'm gathering the best and then i'm going to sacrifice i'm going to slaughter them but that's not what god told him to do it was on the battle it was on the battlefield i told you to do this not yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, but how many times do we see that in the Old Testament? You know, you you uh, you did unauthorized fire and you were consumed or Cain and Abel. Now the that in that story particularly, we don't see the description of okay, this is how I want you to give me an offering. 
it's kind of implied that Cain should have known the proper way. So we, we're not given that in the text, but it's implied when God is like, hey, if you do well, will you not, will I not receive it? So, you know, just to, just to play devil's advocate, someone might say, well, God never instructed him how he was supposed to do it. Why didn't he receive his, um, his offering of, uh, from the fruit of the land? So, but I think that, just to point out that there's similarities in what you just said, trying to do it your own way when God gave a clear instruction. Um, right. And I thought we could just wrap up real quick on just kind of how this uh, Nephilim agenda is continuing. So Dr. Laura mentioned uh, China is doing gene editing, creating super soldiers. And so that's these soldiers are are able to withstand harsher conditions. They're able to, you know, go longer without sleep, all these kinds of things because they're modifying the, the, the genome similar to what Hitler was trying to do with the, what was it? The Ubermensch. <laughs> if I'm, I speak almost no German, uh, the Superman. Um, so that's, right. that's one way that transhumanism human 2.0 is, uh, is continuing in the, in the seed war, the Nephilim agenda. There's a very good, um, well, I don't know, good, but it was interesting. Uh, I think it's a Johnny Depp movie uh, that's very transhumanist from about 10, 15 years ago. I don't recall the name, but it's definitely something that is being done and pushed out and um, talked about. Yeah, I think one of the things, her point in bringing that up was to tie it into today that you could turn on mainstream media and it's being talked about and really just, you don't bat an eye. It just goes in one ear, out the other. You don't even, you don't have an aha moment that this is taking place today by governments in our lifetime. You know what I'm saying? This isn't a science fiction thing like you're talking about with Johnny Depp. This is literally taking place by DARPA, by the Chinese government, by other governments around the world to accomplish their agenda. And it all ties into what she talks about, Nephilim agenda to the Federal Reserve, this enslavement, this control, this, uh, this purposed manipulation to take us to a human 2.0 something different genetically where you know there's been authors like thomas horn and la mazuli have talked about this you know we could we could wake up one morning and look at all the backlash that the unvaccinated were getting just a, a few years ago just socially shamed socially shamed the social credit uh, system that's in china it's spreading around the world mm -hmm. Let's take it to a, a new level with this genetic type stuff. What if it, what if you got your kids in school and everybody else is getting the upgrade? Everybody else is, it is far superior because they're plugged into the matrix. You know what I'm saying? Because it's acceptable. It's what is the norm, the new norm where you're like, no, I'm not putting that foreign thing in my brain or you know, my body or whatever, you know, I'm going to stay up. I'm going to stay a pure human and you're going to be shamed if you don't do the upgrade. Right. And that's why we, I, I, I believe we see that COVID was used as a, as a preconditioning, a precursor of the mark of the beast to have a collective human worldwide experience to condition us, you know, you're not, you're not going with the program. You're an enemy of us. You're not on the side of us. And is it, was it Tim Alberino that kind of postulated that if there was some, you know, alien disclosure or, Hey, we are your creators, you know, um, and, or there, or some alien threat that would unite humanity around a common cause that maybe this mark a genetic upgrade, right, is necessary to defeat this threat. And so it not only, it'll be the highest form of social shaming because if 
if you don't go along with this, you're not on the side of humanity. Right. Yeah. He was hypothesizing a, a scenario like that. And I, I've, I've, and you can't tell me this didn't take place with the, all the mandates and all the social pressure and all the things that the government um, was trying to get us to do, regardless the reason they learned okay you you see you see where there's resistance right yep you see where okay these ones didn't conform these ones didn't okay let's take it to today's terms so what i'm saying is they saw where their efforts were successful and they see where their efforts were not successful where the resistance was the nonconformity was so now when the next pandemic takes place they're going to implement different measures to counteract the resistance they are already in discussions um the biden administration is to line up with the who the world health organization to give our rights over for the next pandemic so so the who will direct it Yes. So if this, it's a bill, it's some type of international, something that our administration is trying to uh, agree with, that when we're in another crisis like that, you won't have state rights. Like I, just because I might live in a certain state doesn't mean I have more freedoms. No, 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 no. When we're, when, when we're all going through it, who has the final say? The WHO, the World Health Organization, will be able to step in and be like, nope, we have authority here. Not your governor, not your representatives, not your own freedoms. You must submit to us. And that's a glo- gl- globalist mentality. Exactly, globalist. That's a, and a scary thing. And, and not only that, right, it's centralized. That's exactly what they want. That's exactly what Revelation predicts is a centralization of religion of money and of government and that is that is the power that they want and what we're talking about is decentralization right that's why we're fans of crypto for example decentralization is is gives the power to the people and it actually makes it able to thrive under persecution um and you know we're talking about church gatherings decentralization actually present uh, prevents uh, heresy more than centralization you know because when it's centralized and institutionalized that's where it's uh, perpetuated when it's a small group of people in a living room if you're all reading the same text of scripture and one guy says i think this verse says that i am god <laughs> you know you, the other people in the room are going i, I didn't get that from that text and you've stopped a you, you've stopped a cult right there, you know. And that's what took place um, during the time of Martin Luther, when he put his not his his grievances on the church door, the ninety five theses. You know, it, he was he was going against the central authority that because people were ignorant, people didn't study for themselves, people didn't know the scriptures. And when he got the revelation by reading it himself, he's like, ah, are you teaching the wrong thing? Because it was centralized. It was one person that was was spoon feeding the people and they just, oh, how many people do it with the government? How many people do it with doctors? They oh, just gosh, take the appeal whatever to authority. Whatever the government says is, 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 yeah, whatever the authority says, it's gospel, it's the truth. Oh, every mainstream media is saying it and must be true. You know, I, I've got to, I've got to fall. My school board says I got to do this. So, you know, what, when did we stop thinking? When thinking did we for stop ourselves. thinking for ourselves? And not only you know? that, not only that, if you try to say something that's maybe counter, oh, what are your credentials? What's your background? Well, does that really matter? If I'm saying something true, it's still true whether I'm some, you know, low IQ, you know, <laughs> I'm just making a generalization. Like if I if I'm some backwoods guy with like a third grade education, but I say something true, 
Does it really matter what my credentials are? You know, or vice versa, somebody with Anthony Fauci's credentials, oh, then he suddenly can't say something wrong. Yeah, it's... Right. Uh, anyway, we could we could go a lot of different directions with that. But just to say that, yeah, this stuff is connected to today. Well, yeah, definitely connected. And that's what Dr. Laura talked about in her book, how the agenda of control and enslavement that started in Genesis 6 through Nimrod to present day Nephilim agenda, looking at the financial enslavement of the Federal Reserve. And then we're talking about all these other issues of enslavement. You know, we brought it up the other week. We're enslaved because of taxation, because of the system. And only only God can free us of this. We're in a situation again, I think Tim Pence talked about that in his interview. We're in a situation again, a modern day, uh, we're living in Egypt. You know, we need to be freed and it's only God that can set us free from the grips of Egypt. Yeah, wow. Yeah, and uh, so to, with that, um, we are fortunate enough, if all goes to plan, to have Tim Bentz uh, with us next week. And he is graciously going to do a follow-up to uh, to us posting a portion of his interview with Rob Skiba talking about the gatekeeping principle, because we just found it so profound and challenging and convicting so yeah looking forward to picking his brain maybe getting some anecdotes on ways that he had to surrender to god in order to have more um influence in his city and be able to do things like deal with uh nephilim uh altars canaanite altars wow so that should be fascinating. And then real quick, too, a couple more guests we have lined up for May. we got Ryan Peterson's going to come on and also Gary Wayne. So, yeah, exciting. So, all right. Well, with that, um, we will sign off for this week. Thanks for listening, everybody, to the Days of Noah podcast. We appreciate each and every one of you. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Pass it along to your family and friends. Help grow the channel. All right, until next time, God bless. See you later.